Hello, Karan. Thank you so much for the invitation to discuss this, I think, really interesting subgroup analysis of an important registration trial for the shockwave intravascular lithotripsy, which actually the timing is impeccable as yesterday, this device is now FDA approved. So you'll be able to have it in your cath labs within the United States. So this is a subgroup analysis I'll be presenting today of intravascular lithotripsy for the treatment of severely calcified long coronary lesions as part of the DISRUPT CAD3 clinical trial. Here are my disclosures. So as background, we all know that severe coronary calcification within target lesions impedes both stent delivery and deployment, which can in turn impair stent expansion, which is a significant predictor of subsequent stent thrombosis and restenosis. Long calcified lesions are therefore inherently more complex and are associated with relatively higher MACE rates and lower procedural success rates following treatment with either balloon angioplasty or rotational or orbital atherectomy. The DISRUPT CAD3 study was a prospective observational single arm study that demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of intravascular lithotripsy to optimize stent deployment in patients with severely calcified de novo coronary stenosis. However, um, whether the length of calcium in the target lesion may influence procedural success and outcomes with IVL is unknown. So the objective of this sub-analysis of the DISRUPT CAD3 study was to examine the safety and effectiveness of IVL in long, the long lesion cohort within this clinical study. So just briefly, for those of you who are unfamiliar with intravascular lithotripsy as it currently stands in our now approved technology in the United States, the concept is using acoustic pressure waves to, to, to safely fracture both intimal and medial calcification. The system comes with a console and a standard balloon catheter or a balloon catheter that looks like a standard balloon catheter but has the ability to provide IVL and there's a actuator handle here. Basically, the balloon is advanced across the lesion, inflated at four atmospheres of pressure and electronic discharge is, is made within the balloon by pressing the button on the uh, physician handle. And this leads to formation of uh, a vapor bubble, which both expands and then contracts, causing an acoustic pressure wave to travel through the tissue with really an effective pressure of 50 atmospheres within the, the intimal and medial uh, wall, which would then fracture both superficial and deep calcification. Importantly, the balloon is only inflated to four atmospheres and a final inflation of six atmospheres to reduce barotrauma. And the balloon expansion, which is done one-to-one -to, -one to the reference vessel diameter, is just to allow the, the pressure wave to be transferred to the vessel wall. So the DISRUPT CAD3 study was a prospective multicenter single arm global IDE of heavily calcified de novo coronary lesions with, with reference vessel diameters between 2.5 and 4 millimeters, a stenosis greater than 50%, and a lesion length less than or equal to 40 millimeters. One role in patient was allowed per site. It's a 47 site study across the globe with an intent to treat population of 384 patients. The primary results of this clinical study were recently published in JAK. So we stratified this cohort of 384 patients by the median lesion length of the population, which was 25 millimeters. So this study is comparing the outcomes in this study among patients with shorter lesions, that is less than 25 millimeters, to those with lesion lengths 25 millimeters or more. This, this trial had a primary endpoint at 30 days. The primary safety endpoint of the trial was freedom from major adverse cardiovascular events at 30 days, which was a defined as a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or target vessel revascularization. The primary effect in this endpoint was procedural success, which was defined as successful stent delivery with a residual stenosis of less than 50% and without in hospital mace. For those of you who think that's too low of a, too low of a threshold, there was also a secondary endpoint looking at residual stenosis of less than 30% without in hospital mace 
as well as device crossing success and angiographic success. These were similar endpoints that led to the approval of orbital atherectomy. And there was, for the overall trial, the, the device met its pre-specified performance criteria. So here, let's look at our subgroup here. So we have 384 patients. Um, there were 191 patients with shorter lesions, 190 patients with longer lesions. There was one patient lost to follow up over time. So at 30 days, we have 190 patients in both groups. Importantly, all the angiographic assessments I am going to show you were performed by a central angiographic core lab. Here are the baseline characteristics of the study population stratified by lesion length. The patients with longer lesions, there were a preponderance of more male patients it was really the only difference. Otherwise, the baseline clinical characteristics were even or well-balanced between the two um, subgroups. What about the angiographic lesion characteristics? Again, adjudicated, adjudicated by the core lab. There were some modest differences. None of these are very surprising. Longer lesions tended to be more common in the right coronary artery. Uh, there was uh, a statistically significant, the more uh, calcified length and lesion length. By definition, these, uh, these, this, the longer group has longer lesions. I would say that to emphasize this long lesion group is a, a extremely complex lesion cohort. The average lesion length, 35.6 millimeters, and the calcified length itself by the angiographic core lab by fluoroscopic calcification was about 55 millimeters. So these are pretty horrific lesions. They're all severely calcified. And you see the uh, definition of um, the core lab of what a severe calcified lesion would be. So tough lesions. These are the procedural characteristics stratified by the, by the, um, by the, uh, the study group. So not surprisingly, longer lesions took longer time to treat there was um, um, more, more pulses used for the longer lesions. Every pulse, again, there's one pulse per second. You're providing lithotripsy. So if you have a longer lesion, you're gonna do pullbacks of this balloon to deliver pulses. So it's not surprising that there were more IVL pulses given. And the number of stents were more in the long lesion groups, all making, that makes common sense. What is somewhat interesting, I think, is that you, as we'll see with the outcomes, there was no statistical difference in terms of the need for pre-dilatation, radial access, um, or post-stent dilatation. So um, in terms of getting the device down and delivering therapy, there appear to be no differences between uh, among lesion length. Here are the angiographic outcomes of this angiographic substudy of the um, dispersed CAD3. There were no significant differences in final in-segment acute gain, MLD, or diameter stenosis. There were statistically significant differences, but in, in absolute terms, fairly marginal differences in final instant acute gain, MLD, and diameter stenosis. Stepping back, if you look at the bar, the column graph, the bar graph, if you look at just less than 30% residual instant diameter stenosis, no difference in longer lesions versus shorter lesions. What about angiographic complications? I find this interesting. So um, if you look at on the left side, this is immediately post-IVL. So does IVL therapy, when you're done with IVL therapy, were there any serious angiographic complications? No differences, but first of all, the number of angiographic complications as it was in dispersed CAD3 were very low. And there were no differences between long and short lesions. You see the, the only um, angiographic complications that were seen in the long cohort were severe dissections of 3%. That was actually statistically not significantly different with shorter lesions. This just shows you angiographically, at least this technology, no slow flow, no no reflow, no abrupt closure, and no perforations. Um, and you see that in both, except for a, a, a rare case of slow flow in the short lesion group. Overall, very safe procedure. If you look at the final post-stance complications, Again, low event rates, no, compl no, no differences between the two legion length groups. So here's the primary effectiveness endpoint. Remember, this is procedural success, which is the ability to deliver the stent with a residual stenosis of less than 50% by core assessment without inhospitable major adverse cardiovascular events. No differences with long lesions versus short lesions, a p-value of 0 0.2.
What about device crossing success? One could argue this is, you know, there is, it is a, a fairly a stiffer and a more bulkier device compared to your standard angiographic uh, post, uh, your standard balloon angioplasty balloon. But no differences in crossing success, irrespective of long or short lesions. The numbers are pretty much spot on the same. Here's the primary safety endpoint, freedom from 30-day mace. No difference in long lesions versus short lesions, maybe numerically lower freedom from 30-day mace among patients with longer lesions, but this did not lead, reach statistical significance. If you look at the breakdown of the components of major adverse cardiovascular events stratified by lesion length, now we're looking at sub, sub, subgroups. So let's take this with a, a grain of salt in terms of the p-values. None of the p-values were statistically significant, although there were more MACE events in longer lesions versus shorter lesions. I think this makes sense. These are more complex lesions. So this was driven really by non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, periperitoneal MI, which did not reach the Q-wave definition. They were more common in the longer lesions versus shorter lesions. Of course, these were both treated by IVL. This, there is no comparator group. Um, um, of, a, of a control here. So in conclusion then, the Disrupt C83 study long lesion cohort included a remarkably complex lesion subset. I would say one of the more complex lesion subsets ever studied in a prospective FDA registration study, a mean lesion length of 37 millimeters and a mean calcium length of 55 millimeters. Despite this complexity, IVL was associated with a statistically similar rate of the primary safety and effectiveness endpoints compared with shorter lesions, similar procedural and device crossing success rates, and the 30-day MACE rates were numerically higher with longer lesions driven by non-QAV MIs, although this did not reach statistical significance with any p-values of less than 0.05. There were no episodes of abrupt closure, slow flow, or no reflow immediately after IVL treatments or stent deployment in the long lesion group speaking to the safety of this procedure. And uh, all in all, therefore, IVL is an attractive therapy to address severely calcified lesions across a spectrum of lesion length. So with that, Alok and um, Ron, I will, uh, my time is up and I will leave it at that.